we, we know that we are not worthy. Uh, but God, it's all about you. And we're so thankful, God, that it is all about you. Uh, God, we love you. We praise you. We pray, God, that you be with us here tonight. God, that you just move in this place. That everything that happens here will be all about you. And that it will all give you honor and glory. And we just ask it in Jesus' name.
school. Got some effect going. Is it still sounding weird? Is that normal? Normal now? Cool. Close enough? It's never going to be completely normal as long as it's my voice. But as long as it doesn't hurt anybody, that's the main thing. All right. Over the next few weeks, I've been uh, thinking about some heroes in the Bible that I think uh, I would love to just spend a night on each one over the next few weeks. And uh, there are a lot of heroes in the Word of God. Now, recognize that that's not what the Word of God's about, right? It's about God. It's about what He's doing. But it's a beautiful thing to see Him doing it through people like you and me. People who trust in God and through their faith in Him and allowing Him to work in their life, they become heroes that we look up to and we, we look to them for an example. And tonight we're going to talk about probably the most obvious, right? Mordecai. The one everybody was thinking of as soon as I said heroes, y'all went to Mordecai, right? Now some of y'all are like, who's Mordecai? We never even heard of Mordecai. Mordecai is in the book of Esther, right? Mordecai was Esther's cousin. Now, as we look at the book of Esther, and as, as we see the things that, that transpire here, we need to remember when this takes place. Now, the book of Esther is kind of close to the front of the Old Testament. Now, it's before uh, the Psalms and Proverbs, which is kind of the halfway mark. So it's kind of in the first half of the Bible first part, but it really happens close to the end of the Old Testament, all right, it's about 475 B.C., during the reign of King Xerxes, okay, so remember that even though you look back at Esther and you see it way back over there in the first part of the Bible, that's not chronologically when it took place, it took place just right before the intertestament period, okay, all right, now, let's take a look at my buddy Mordecai, one of the heroes that I really look up to in the Word of God. Stand with me. I'm not going to make you stand with me as we read through the entire book of Esther because we're not going to do that, all right? Just set y'all's minds at ease. But as we read this first section in chapter 2 of the book of Esther, you see the king Xerxes, his, his wife, his queen Vashti, had disobeyed, had, had acted up, and he had banished her, and now... The time came for him to find a new queen because all of his advisors said, hey, let's go out and get all the beautiful virgins of the land and all your provinces and bring them in. We'll set up a harem and you take your pick. and Whichever one you like the best, you let her be the queen instead of Vashti. And King Xerxes said, I like the idea. I like the way you guys think. Let's go with it, okay? So here we are in chapter 2, beginning in verse 5, all right? If I can find it. All right, here we go. Now there was a Jew in Susa, the citadel, whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, son of Shimei, son of Kish, a Benjaminite, who had been carried away from Jerusalem among the captives, carried away by Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away. He was bringing up Hadassah, that is, Esther, the daughter of his uncle, for she had neither father nor mother. The young woman had a beautiful figure and was lovely to look at. And when her father and her mother died, Mordecai took her in as his own daughter. So when the king's order and his edict were proclaimed, and when many young women were gathered in Susa, the citadel, in custody of Haggai, Esther also was taken into the king's palace and put in custody of Haggai who had charge of the women and the young woman pleased him and won his favor and he quickly provided her with her cosmetics and her portion of food and with seven chosen young women from the king's palace and advanced her and her young women to the best place in the harem Esther had not made known her people or kindred for Mordecai had commanded her not to make it known. And every day Mordecai walked in front of the court of the harem to learn how Esther was. 
and what was happening to her. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much for allowing us to be together tonight. Lord, we pray that you'll speak to our hearts as we study your word. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Got that thing on mute? <laughs> hey, technology, you got to love it. All right. Now, take a look at Mordecai. What was Mordecai doing? When we were first introduced to Mordecai, what's he doing? He's doing that thing that James tells us way over at the end of the New Testament is the thing that defines a Christian. He's taking care of an orphan. He's loving on an orphan. He sees this girl. Now, remember that she was his cousin. Now, we always thought of Mordecai as the uncle of Esther, but no, he was actually her cousin. She was the daughter of his uncle, so they were the same generation. So, but obviously he was a little older because he was able to take care of her, take her in and raise her as his daughter. But she was his cousin. Now, I had some cousins that would not have taken me in, I can promise you. They'd have taken me out back, kicked me around a little bit, probably broke a couple ribs, but I don't think they would have taken me in to raise. But when I look at Mordecai, I see a man who was living a Christian life in 475 B.C. He was looking after an orphan, loving her and raising her as his very own daughter. That impresses me. It's one thing to share with others, to share your money. It's one thing to share. And we teach our kids to share, right? Share your toys. Share, share, share. We teach them that over and over. But to share your life with somebody, that's a big investment. And I look around this room and I see people who've done the exact same thing. Taking in people who they don't have an obligation to, but they do it because that's just who they are. They're God's people. They're living God's way. And Mordecai was one of these people. And we see Mordecai doing the honorable thing, taking care of Hadassah, or Esther, his cousin. And then you look over in verses 19 through 23, and we see Mordecai doing the honorable thing again as he warns the king of a plot. It says, Now when the virgins were gathered together the second time, Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. Now, in the meanwhile, what I haven't read to you was that the king fell in love with Hadassah or Esther and made her his queen. Okay? She is now the queen instead of Vashti. All right? And the king gives a great feast and he loves Esther and everything's great and he gives gifts and all that good stuff. And when the virgins were gathered together the second time, beginning in verse 19, Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. Esther had not made known her kindred or her people as Mordecai had commanded her because she still obeyed Mordecai. All right? She respected him. She loved him because that was the kind of man he was. That was the kind of cousin he was. That was the kind of father he had become to her. And he told her it's not safe for everybody to know who that you're a Jew, so don't tell them. All right? So she still hadn't done that. For Esther obeyed Mordecai just as when she was brought up by him. And in those days, Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. And Bigthan and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs who guarded the threshold, became angry and sought to lay hands on King Xerxes. And they came to the knowledge, and this came to the knowledge of Mordecai, and he told it to Queen Esther. And Esther told the king in the name of Mordecai. When the affair was investigated and found to be so, the men were both hanged on the gallows. And it was recorded in the book of the Chronicles in the presence of the king. Now, why do you think that Mordecai told Esther not to tell everybody she was a Jew? Why do you think that might have been? Do you think there were people in the kingdom who hated the Jews? Can you, can you imagine a time when there weren't people who hated the Jews? That's just kind of the way things work, right? People hate the Jews especially Arab, right? It's just the way it is. Now, we're talking about the king of the Syrians, okay? These people, they're 
are a lot of high-ranking officials in the court. There are a lot of high-ranking officials throughout all the provinces of the kingdom who hate the Jews. This is not a kingdom that's friendly necessarily to the Jews. Now we remember Darius. He was a good king. He was friendly to the Jews. There have been kings of the Babylonians and of the Persians and the Syrians and all these different guys. There's, every once in a while there's a good king who comes along and he's friendly to the Jews. But for the most part, people aren't friendly to the Jews. They don't like the Jews. Okay? That whole um, anti-Semitic thing has been going on forever. Ever since Abraham. People have hated the Jews. Now, he said, don't tell anybody you're a Jew. This kingdom is not necessarily friendly to the Jews. For one thing, y'all got to remember that in, in the book of Esther, we don't see Xerxes necessarily as a crazy man, but history records him to be pretty crazy. He, was a, a, he, he, was, he thought of he was a god. He thought he was God. He was the God-man, he called himself. All right, Xerxes was nuts. All right? He was a very violent man. If you don't believe me, ask Queen Vashti. All right? Now, Xerxes wasn't all that crazy about the Jewish people. It wasn't like he would have said, Oh, you're a Jew? Awesome. That's wonderful. Woo! Let's throw a party. So Mordecai said, Just don't tell them. I'm not telling you to lie about it. Just leave it out. Right? So now Mordecai is sitting there and he hears these guys planning to kill this crazy king who's not that big of a fan of the Jews after all, right? And he hears this, and, he's, and I'm sure in his mind, Mordecai's torn a little bit. Here's this high and mighty king who has oppressed my people, doesn't really respect my people as the people of God. And I hear that somebody's trying to kill him. What should I do? I'm sure a lot of men in that situation would have kept their mouths shut and just maybe smiled a little bit as they walked away. But that wasn't Mordecai. Mordecai was a man of integrity. Mordecai was a man who did what was right. He re respected his God and his, the rules that his God had laid out and he went and he told Esther exactly what he had heard. The king had it investigated, found it to be true, had the men executed. It was written down in the chronicles of the king and everybody went on about their business. All right? Now, that's the kind of man Mordecai was. He did the honorable thing. Now look in chapter 3. We see Mordecai again doing what was right, refusing to bow down. Haman, the Agagite, comes along, he's elevated to the highest position in the, in the political arena there. All right? He was the, the top courtier. He was not the king, but he was as close as you could get. He was the big man, kind of like in the White House, right? The chief of staff pretty much runs everything. That was Haman, the Agagite. And he's coming through, and everybody starts bowing down to Haman, except Mordecai. Mordecai says, I'm not bowing down. Seems like there's three other guys that didn't bow down, right? What were their names? Also known as? Right? We remember them. We think of them as heroes because they would not bow down. Mordecai wouldn't bow down. He said, I'm not bowing down to you, Haman. Not gun dut. Right? Not gun dut. Go on. And all the people around him said, hey, man, that's Haman. You've got to bow down to Haman. And every day, day after day, he would not do it. You look, and it says, and after these things, uh, Xerxes promoted Haman the Agagite, the son, and all the king's servants who were at the king's gate bowed down and paid homage to Haman. For the king had so commanded concerning him. But Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage. Then the king's servants who were at the king's gate said to Mordecai, Why do you transgress the king's command? And when they spoke to him day after day, and he would not listen to them, they went and told Haman, in order to see whether Mordecai's words would stand. For he had told them that he was a Jew. Now he told Esther 
Don't tell him you're a Jew because it might be dangerous. When the king's people come to him and said, you've got to bow down to Haman, he said, I'm not bowing down to him. I'm a Jew. I bow to no one but my God. Now listen, when you read this, you've got to recognize something. The word, the name of God is not in the book of Esther. The only book in the Bible that does not mention the name of God. But he's here. He's present. And there's a reason that Mordecai would not bow down to Haman. It's because of his God. He said, I'm not going to do that. There's no way. It's not going to happen. Not ever. I remember three other guys not too long ago. I've heard the stories about those guys, and they didn't bow down, and God took care of them. And I'm not afraid of Haman. I'm afraid of God. Right? And don't you wish that people were still afraid of God? You know, this morning Josh said that word fear of the Lord. Sometimes we take that word fear of the Lord and we, we twist it around and, and all these different things. And we understand that it, it means reverence and respect. But in a lot of ways it also means fear, right? I remember when I was doing something wrong and my dad walked through the door. There was reverence, there was respect, and there was fear. Not that he was going to do something terrible to me, but that he was going to do what I deserved to have done to me. Right? He usually didn't. <laughs> Mordecai knew that he was not going to bow down because he feared God more than he feared Haman. He feared God more than he feared even crazy King Xerxes. He feared God. We need to fear God. People today need to fear God. And you think about Haman hating old Mordecai. Why do you think Haman hated Mordecai so much? It became his obsession. It's all he thought about. From that day until the day he died, all he could think about was how to humiliate or defeat Mordecai. Haman hated Mordecai. He hated all the Jews. We see that Haman was an Agagite. Y'all know what an Agagite is? It sounds like some sort of a rock or something that you put into, you know, <laughs> concrete. But he's a descendant of Agag, right? I would assume that any descendant of Agag would hate the Jews because he was the king that God had ordered Saul to kill. To destroy. He said, you kill all of the Amalekites. Don't leave a single one. Don't leave any children. Don't leave any women. Don't leave any men. Don't take any, any of the plunder. Wipe it out. Wipe them out completely. But Saul disobeyed. Samuel came along and killed Agag, but his wife and child survived. And here we see the Agagite, Haman. I imagine that had a lot to do with why he hated the Jews and why he hated Mordecai. I think the fact that Mordecai is the only one who didn't bow down to him had a lot to do with why he hated Mordecai. And when he found out Mordecai was a Jew, it made him hate Mordecai and the Jews all the more to where it became his passion. It's all he thought about. It's all he cared about. It's all he wanted to do was destroy them. And now, Mordecai finds out that he's going to try to destroy all the Jews everywhere. Haman goes to the king, sets up a deal. All the Jews are going to be wiped out on this certain day, and it's all done. And Mordecai goes to Esther and says, you've got to say something to the king. You've got to do something. The king has to know. You can't allow your people to be wiped out, Esther. And she says, you know what happens to anyone who goes into the king's presence without being summoned, right? And Mordecai says, yes, I know. They're killed. She says, I'm not going to do that. I can't. And we read the one very famous thing that Mordecai said. We see him giving wise counsel to his beloved cousin. And in chapter 4, verse 12, And they told Mordecai what Esther had said. Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, Do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. 
And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Man, that is good stuff. Mordecai was a wise man. And what we see in this, not only his wisdom and his ability to counsel this young woman that he loved so much and who loved him, but we see faith in God. Where was this deliverance going to come from? He didn't know, but he knew it was going to come from God. God will deliver his people, Esther. Believe that. Yes, I understand you're afraid of Xerxes, and I know that you're afraid. If you go into his chamber without being summoned, that the punishment is death. And I'm sure that's scary. But you need to realize something. God is God, not Xerxes. God will deliver his people. Do you want to be a part of it or not? You're in a position where you can make a difference. Are you going to be a part of what God's doing or not? He says, who knows? But they both knew. When he says, who knows? Maybe you've come to the kingdom for such a time as this. I think they both knew that's exactly what was going on. That's exactly why she was there. We don't see the name of God in the book of Esther, but we see God here. We see Mordecai's faith in God revealed because he obviously trusts that God's going to deliver his people either through Esther or through somebody else. So one night, Xerxes can't sleep. So he does what we all do. He calls in the statisticians and and, and the scribes and he says, start reading to me from the Chronicle of the Kings. Read me some history because that will put me to sleep, right? Read me some history. I just need to hear the history. Just start reading. Pick a page and start reading. So they open it up and they start reading. And they read about the plot to kill him. And they read about the man, Mordecai, who had saved the king's life. And the king says, what's been done for this man to honor him for what he has done for me? And they say, nothing. And the king says, we've got to do something. Look out and see who's in the court. And they look out and they say, oh, it's Haman. Haman's in the court. Well, go get him. Bring him in here. So they bring in Haman. And the king says to Haman, he says, Haman, what should be done for the man whom the king wishes to honor? And Haman in his mind says, who would the king want to honor more than me? Obviously, the king is ready to honor me. So Haman says, oh, you should should bring him robes that the king has worn and and a horse that the king has ridden and give them to him and, 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 and a ring and a crown and have a nobleman, the noblest of the noblemen you can find to come and, and put these things upon him and honor him and lead him through the streets as everyone cheers. And he says, that's a great idea, Haman. Go and get Mordecai the Jew and do this to him. And Haman is so excited. He is so happy to be able to honor Mordecai. And... Uh, <laughs> It backfired on him just a little. In verse 11 of chapter 6 of the book of Esther, So Haman took the robes and the horse, and he dressed Mordecai and led him through the square of the city, proclaiming before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Then Mordecai returned to the king's gate, but Haman hurried to his house, mourning with his head covered. Mordecai was not interested in being honored. He didn't try to elevate himself. He didn't even go to the king himself and tell him about the plot. He had Esther do it. Haman was the one who wanted to be elevated. Haman was the one who wanted to be honored. And what happened? Kind of like Jesus said, the one who honors himself is humbled. And the humble man is honored. Mordecai is honored by the king, honored by the man who hates him more than anybody else on the planet, and honored by everyone in the streets. Why? Because he stood for what was right. He did the right thing when he was faced with the decision. Right after this, we see Esther's dinner, and she exposes Haman for the scumbag that he is, And uh, Xerxes has him hanged. 
on the gallows that Haman himself had had built for Mordecai. Xerxes' decree, however, cannot be undone. But what Xerxes does is he says, the Jews have the right to defend themselves. In fact, all of my loyal followers out there are to support the Jews in what they're doing. And guess what happens? In chapter 9 we see it was Mordecai who records the victory that the Jews had. The Jews win. Mordecai records the victory. He calls all the Jews in every region to remember their deliverance every year on the same days and the Feast of Purim is uh, established. And as we look at all this stuff and all that's going on and everything that's in the book of Esther, I ask, who is the hero of the book of Esther? Mordecai is one for sure. God, yes. God's the hero of every, everything. Every, you know, every good gift comes from the Father. So anything good that happens, we've got to give him the credit. But Mordecai is the hero. Is Esther a hero? Sure. You can call Esther a hero. She showed bravery. She did great things. She's an amazing woman, especially to be so young. But Mordecai is definitely one of the heroes here. And how was he a hero? How was he a hero? Did he have superhuman strength? Did he have above average intelligence? Did he make a 42 on his ACT? which is not even possible? Was he smarter than everybody else? Was he taller, stronger, braver, maybe braver? What he did was he was a man who did what he knew was the right thing to do. Did he make mistakes? Of course he did. While he was raising Hadassah, I'm sure he made lots of mistakes. Anybody who's ever raised a teenage girl knows that's just going to happen. I'm sure there were times he said something and she ran screaming out of the room crying and he didn't have a clue what happened. But he loved her. He took care of her. He did what was best for her. When the time came, he tried to protect her. Don't tell him you're a Jew. Then they come to him, why aren't you bowing down? I'm a Jew. He wasn't scared for him. He was scared for her. He wanted to protect her. He wasn't worried about himself. The danger that might come upon him. He was going to stand for what was right. He was a man who did what was right. And God used him for it. I want to read to you from Esther chapter 9. Just a few verses. 1 through 4. Now in the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar, on the thirteenth day, of the same, when the king's command and edict were about to be carried out, on the very day when the enemies of the Jews hoped to gain the mastery over them, the reverse occurred. The Jews gained mastery over those who hated them. The Jews gathered in their cities throughout all the provinces of King Xerxes to lay hands on those who sought their harm. And no one could stand against them, for the fear of them had fallen on all peoples. All the officials of the provinces and the satraps and the governors and the royal agents also helped the Jews, for the fear of Mordecai had fallen on them. For Mordecai was great in the king's house, and his fame spread throughout all the provinces, for the man Mordecai grew more and more powerful. Mordecai, kind of almost like a Joseph. Almost like a Joseph. The powerful men... The, powerful, the most powerful man in town besides Xerxes, Haman, hated him, wanted to destroy him, did everything he could, working in the back, working in the front, whatever he could do to destroy this man Mordecai and all of his people. And yet God protected Mordecai. Why? Because Mordecai was great, strong, wonderful, awesome. No, because Mordecai was faithful. He was faithful to do what he knew was right. He was faithful to raise his cousin who needed somebody to take care of her. He was faithful when he heard about something bad that was about to happen. Even though it wasn't to the greatest person in the world or maybe somebody he was a big fan of, he knew it wasn't right. And he went and he interceded. When he knew something bad was about to happen, he gave his little cousin courage 
to stand and do what was right. He was just a normal guy doing what was right. And he's a hero. And it says the fear of Mordecai came upon them. Wow. At the beginning of the story, there was nobody fearing Mordecai. He didn't work out. He didn't learn how to use a sword. He just followed God and did what he knew was the right thing to do. And in the end, we see a powerful hero emerge that everyone respected. A great man of the faith, Mordecai. Now, y'all stand with me just for a moment. We're going to have just a moment of response. And I know that when you talk about heroes of the faith, there are men that come to your mind. There's David's, right, and Samson's, and, and all these great Gideons, the ju- all the judges, men in the New Testament, Paul, Peter, even Timothy, men and women like Esther and Ruth. Up into your mind and you think that's a hero of the faith. But let me tell you something. A hero of the faith is someone who stands for the Word of God. There are heroes of the faith that I've worked with in factories over the years. That I've played golf with, that I've hunted with, that I've just sat and talked with. Men and women who will stand for the Word of God. Even when it's not popular. Even when it might be dangerous to their well-being, maybe their health, maybe just their financial well-being, whatever. Heroes stand for the Word of God. So tonight, if you know someone who's in that situation that needs to stand for the Word of God and you want to pray for them, pray for them. Maybe tonight you're standing here and that's you. Maybe You see things in your workplace, in your home even, that you know you need to take a stand for. And you're not one of those super Christians like we read about. But maybe you're a Mordecai. Just an average, everyday person who's willing to do what's right and stand for the Word of God. During this time of response, if God's spoken to your heart about somebody or about something in your life that you need to deal with, this is your time to deal with it. You just need to come and pray. You need to come talk to me about something that's going on in your life. Maybe it could be anything. This is your time. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you, God, that we can, like Mordecai, trust in you. And know that even though we don't have everything figured out, we don't understand all the things that go on in this world, Lord, that you are still God and you are in control and that you are going to do what you are going to do and that you want to use us in so many different ways to carry out your perfect will, to share your gospel, to love the orphans, the widows, the broken. And God, we pray tonight that you give each of us the strength and the courage to stand. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.